coming to you from our Eros Park studios here in the capital, Vintuk. This is the Tuesday edition of Primetime News. Many thanks for tuning in. I'm Salima Shimwefeleni Masipa. We begin tonight's broadcast on the international front. The UN Security Council on Monday rejected a Russian resolution condemning spiraling violence in the Middle East with delegates refusing to back a motion that did not single out Hamas for its surprise attack on Israel that left at least 1,400 people dead. More context from this report. The Council huddled as Israel readied for an expected ground assault on the Gaza Strip after air and artillery strikes that officials say have killed at least 2,750 people. Palestinian Ambassador Riyad Manzur said the council had a moral duty to act in bed to restrain an Israeli assault on the Gaza Strip he said was claiming 12 lives every hour. Don't send the signal that the Palestinian lives don't matter. Don't dare say Israel is not responsible for the bombs it is dropping over their heads. Don't justify the killings. Don't blame the victim. And I repeat, don't. Don't do that. What is happening in Gaza is not a military operation. It is a full-scale assault against our people. It is massacres against innocent civilians. Israel's Gilad Erdin said the Security Council, which has not adopted a resolution on the situation in Israel and the Palestinian territories since 2016, stood at one of its most pivotal crossroads since its founding in the aftermath of World War II. Will the Council support the fight for civilization or will it incentivize the genocidal jihadists who aim to murder all the infidels? Back home, the governor of the Omaheke region, Pihon Ganate, recently articulated the effects of the government's ban, which forbade the purchase of vehicles for officers, ministries, agencies, on the running of several government agencies in the region. Ganate shared his observations during a meeting of the National Council Standing Committee on Transport, Infrastructure and Housing, which is looking at how the ban on offices, ministries and agencies may affect them. Let's listen in. I don't think we, we need to be stranded with cars that are standing, the judges fall and sometimes small things. And if a car is written off, you cannot even take parts from that car and put on another car. Apparently it's not allowed. That car have to go for auctioning. Other issues is the issue of insurance to government cars that are not insured. And once a car is involved in an accident, it's right off and, and it's a loss to government. So I believe some of those things need to be ruled out. Uh, and I don't know why we're doing that, but those are some of the things that are really backtracking the whole service of government garages. Yeah, but the moratorium is long overdue, need to be lifted because all of us are driving cars that are risky. The other day I accompanied the Deputy Prime Minister just for my car to leave me in uh, uh, Talismanes and I had to come back with an NBC car. So the fleet is not reliable at all and the moratorium need to be left at now. So that's, those are my opinions. But generally government garages can do better, but they are being run from Venduk. It can be. We cannot talk of decentralization and then still people have to be run from Venduk instead of at regional level. Yeah, and then generally when you even you look at artisans at government uh, ministry of works, they are doing nothing. All the works have to go to tenders, even replacing a, a class door. Someone who's on a year tender must replace that class door. Onto a rather unfortunate incident, a 25-year-old man died instantly on Saturday after he was reportedly stabbed once in the chest in the telecom informal settlement at Ochivarongo. Namibian Police Forces Head of Community Affairs in the Oshadonjupa region, Inspector Maureen Beha, in the weekend crime report on Monday, indicated that the deceased was identified by relatives as Aldrich Geiseb. 
The incident allegedly occurred around 2.40 on Saturday. A friend of the deceased, also aged 25, handed himself over at the Chuarongo police station on Sunday in connection with the matter, Mbea said. Mbea added the knife suspected to have been used in the stabbing was allegedly dumped in a pit latrine by the suspect. Preliminary police investigations revealed that the two had an argument over 50 Namibian dollars. Khaisep allegedly wanted to stab the suspect, but the suspect grabbed the knife and used it to stab Khaisep in the chest, killing him instantly, said Mbeha. The suspect is expected to appear in the magistrate court at Ochoarongo during the week. Police investigations continue. Reporting for Primetime News, Chakonia Nehemia. On to courts, the Katutura Magistrates Court on Monday acquitted City Police Officer Fabian Amukwelele on rape and kidnapping charges. Amukwelele, who at the time of his arrest in April 2020 was the City Police's spokesperson, was accused of holding a colleague captive in his rented home in Rocky Crest. This, the state alleged, was before he raped her. The incident, according to the state, occurred between 10 and 11 January 2020. More from this insert. Magistrate Leopold Hangolo, in delivering his judgment, found that the state witnesses' accounts were inconsistent. He also remarked that the complainant's testimony fell short of the standard of proof required for conviction. The state, he said, failed to prove the alleged charges beyond reasonable doubt. Hangolo also found that Amukwelele had been consistent in his testimonies throughout the trial. Amukwelele's version of events is that he and the complainants in the matter had consensual sexual intercourse. The complainant was 27 at the time. Amukwelele was represented by Sisa Namanje. Reporting for Primetime News, Diana Kauta. Stay tuned for the business segment. Welcome to the Primetime Biz segment, your leading source for the latest developments in the world of business and economics. Ophthalmologist Dr. Helena Ndume on Monday noted that MTC's assistance over the past two years has empowered their medical professionals diagnose and treat a wide range of eye conditions with accuracy and precision. Ndume made the remarks during the announcement of MTC's investment of $12.5 million Namibian dollars in corporate social investment projects for the financial year 2023-2024. Your belief in our cause encourages us to continue striving towards creating a world where everyone has access to care, regardless of their economic or social standing in the communities. And they receive this state-of-the-art uh, help without paying an arm and a leg for it. And that is what we are aiming for, especially in our ophthalmology department. On his part, MTC's managing director, Liki Rastis, stated at the event that while they are proud of their contributions, they recognize your journey towards sustainability is ongoing. And our view is that there should be absolutely no competition amongst corporate companies, whether in the public or private sector, when it comes to CSI. We must collaborate, we must engage each other, and we need to partner if we want to make a real impact in society. 
the beneficiaries of the CSI project are One Economy Foundation, MTC Rural School Project, Nation Internship Project, DW Land Delivery Initiative, DW Early Childhood Development, MTC for Life, MTC Key, Vision Restoration Initiative, Hope Village, Community Seed Bank, Kunone Early Warning System Sorting, and the Sourcing Initiative by the City of Venduk. On to some positive developments within the local agro sector. Helena Haita from the Community Seed Bank announced the establishment of seed banks across the country, enabling local farmers to access, share and exchange plant seeds. Haita made the revelation at the announcement of MTC's investment of 12.5 million Namibian dollars in corporate social investment projects for the financial year 2023-2024. More context from this report. Growing up, we all grew up in either farms or rural communities like Northern Part. We used to eat different type of fruits or, or, or plants from our fields. But all of a sudden, this type of plants are kind of either becoming rare or you don't just see them at all. Where are they? Things are changing. So the seed bank is here to conserve or protect our indigenous plant species from our old umahangus, from our old uh, beans, those ones, the tastier one, you know, the one we used to eat. So they are getting scarce. We are losing them. And this is because of development. Uh, large lack of rents are being cleared up because of schools and other uh, developmental activities, mining, the big corporate, it's clearing a lot of uh, uh, this type of land. So we are reserving those plants or seeds so that we don't lose them. So we, thanks to LTC, last year they gave us uh, an amount to construct a seed bank. So because we are the only one national seed bank in Namibia, so we want to decentralize this uh, activity to the local areas or their regions. So we constructed one of its kind uh, in Kavango West region, Sanko uh, village. So in this uh, community seed bank, communities are willing to uh, sell or manage their seeds. They are going to protect and store their seed within those uh, uh, structures. Those days you can, see, you can find this seed sometime in your home. Grandmother is having this seed, a bottle full of seed, kept somewhere. And you're like, what are this seed doing here? So with the community seed banks, they have that kind of governed uh, environment where they are going to keep their seed, and they are able to exchange among themselves. So basically, we do not necessarily need uh, large companies to sell seed to our community because a lot of our food we eat, they are homegrown. So if we can have these seed banks, we can promote food security. For tomorrow's countrywide forecast, let's now consult the weather report.
Sport Planet is your ultimate destination for everything sports related. We begin locally as the Brave Warriors prepare for the biggest footballing showpiece on the continent. What are the lads' chances of making it far in the tournament? While former Brave Warriors coach Ricardo Minetti recently gave us a peek into his crystal ball. The former gaffer is optimistic about Namibia's representation at the upcoming AFCON tournament if the team is well prepared and fairly compensated. In an interview with the Namibia Press Agency recently, Manetti stated that the draw has many similarities to that of the 2019 group that Namibia last competed in at the AFCON finals in Egypt. Manetti believes that the lads can give an improved account of themselves next year than they did in 2019 if everything is done according to the coach and technical team's wishes. On to boxing. Junior lightweight boxer Flame Special One Nangolo won the national championships for the second time on Saturday after outclassing his opponent David Opua Flash Shinuna during AC Boxing's Rising Stars Boxing Bonanza. The Rising Stars Boxing Bonanza was held at the Wondrous Sports Field with the event featuring six different bouts on the night. Nangolo, who has nine professional fights with nine wins, added another victory to his name, but outboxing Shinuna, who has 16 fights, six wins, two draws and eight losses. The young Namibian, who also holds the African Boxing Union Super Featherweight title, landed crucial punches during the rounds that saw all three judges scoring the fight in his favor after 10 rounds of boxing. Stay tuned for your sports roundup. On that note, we have come to the end of tonight's broadcast. Many thanks for having tuned into your go-to news channel. Before we wrap it up, a kind reminder that to be part of the Nampa TV community, do follow the on-screen prompts by subscribing to the channel. Otherwise, from myself, Salima Shumwefeleni Masipa, alongside my dedicated production crew behind the scenes, it's bye-bye till tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>